All right, so uh, we are right in the middle of the respiratory cycle. We've gone through what's going on in relaxed state, which uh, is going to be no airflow because we have no appreciable uh, pressure gradient between the external environment and the uh, pressure inside of the lungs. Then during inhalation, we have to increase volume of the thoracic cavity in the lungs, which causes a concomitant decrease in pressure, drops it below the normal environmental pressure, and air begins to flow down from high pressure in the environment to low pressure in the lungs. And as air fills up that volume, the lung volume, we should see this slow decrease or this change in, in air flow until it ceases when those two pressures are once again equalized. So those are the two, two phases. We're going to pick up with phase number three, which will be exhalation. could also call this expiration. All right, so at this point, we've increased the volume of the lungs, and as air has flowed in, we now have a much larger amount of air in the lungs. So the lungs at the very beginning of phase three are filled with air. And that volume is going to be full of air. Now, if it's a small little breath, obviously it's just a small amount of air that comes in, or if you're getting ready to blow out your birthday candles, you fill it up with a much bigger amount of air, a much larger amount of air. So what do we need to do? Why don't we start with that? What needs to happen here if we're going to expire or exhale air? Tell me a little bit about lung volume. Have to decrease lung volume, which is going to cause a increase in pressure. And how do you think we're going to actually accomplish this task of decreasing the volume? Basically drop the thoracic cavity back onto the lungs and move back towards that resting position. Okay, diaphragm. What's it going to do? It relaxes, and what happens when it relaxes? So when it relaxes, normally, when, or when it's contracted, it's it's flat. Normally, during a relaxed state, it domes up into the thoracic cavity, presses up on the bottom of the lungs. How about the rib cage? It's going to collapse back down. The, buckets, the bucket handle is going to swing back down towards the bucket. So we're going to accomplish this. by the actions of the intercostals and the diaphragm. Going through relaxation. So they're going to relax. And as the diaphragm and the intercostals relax, the bottom of the thoracic cavity the diaphragm is no longer flattened, and so it goes inward. And the ribs return to their resting position. And when I say to resting position, I mean the position or rib location during that first phase, phase one relaxed state. So return to the resting position. So from a musculature standpoint, we're actually mimicking what occurs during the relaxed state here during expiration. But we have a full volume of uh, a full air volume in our lungs, and I would just kind of squished everything back down onto the lungs. So the thoracic cavity and the attached or the associated lung volume. I'm going to decrease, and then because of our inverse relationship, the lung pressure, the pressure inside of that container we call the lungs, is going to increase because of the container's decrease in volume. Okay, so as we begin to increase lung pressure, Remember, what's our starting point? What's the pressure like inside of the lungs? 
Yeah, isometric. Um, yeah, I would say that it's just simply equal to the pressure in the environment. And so now, as lung pressure increases, we begin to move above the environmental pressure. So pressure between the environment and the lungs. We have an increase in lungs or uh, uh, increase in pressure that makes the lungs more than the environment. So higher pressure in, in the lungs than in the environment. That's the development of our pressure gradient. favors air to flow <coughs> out of the lungs. <coughs> so, um, Labs 12 and 13, which are coming up after Easter break, um, you're going to deal a little bit with spirometry, which is the measurement of air flow from the lungs. Um, I do want you to review lung volumes. Um, make sure that you sit down and do that. I'm going to just give you sort of a brief little introduction here to lung volumes. Lung volumes are very important um, uh, for clinical indications. Um, and, and there are certain things that happen in diseases that can change airflow, how fast air can be moved in and out of the lungs, and also how much air can be moved in and in, into the lungs. If you're a smoker, you build up tar and things like that in the lungs, begins to collect in the alveoli, consume some of the space that should be consumed by air. So lung volume will actually decrease. Um, bronchitis or emphysema or even things like um, asthma will reduce the uh, the uh, diameter of the trachea, and this is going to change airflow. And you can you can pick all of that information up, or you can quantify those lung volume changes and airflow changes with uh, a, te a technique that's known as spirometry. And this is just simply uh, a technique where we basically analyze the gases and the air that's being inhaled and expired, exhaled from an individual. Uh, and there's a specific trace that should become, uh, should be produced by an individual who actually has uh, normal functioning lungs. And any deviation from that normal could be an indication of decreased um, uh, respiratory function and, and respiratory physiology. Um, so just to kind of give you just a really, really brief introduction to what's going on here. Whenever you look at a, a spirogram, it's basically going to be a figure that shows you time. So we move through time and then generate or produce volume in some sort of liter or milliliter measurement along the, the y-axis. Now, you can't ever get rid, fully get rid of all of the air out of your lungs. Even if, you know, you maybe you've fallen out of a tree before and you're like, oh, I got the wind knocked out of me and that pressure kind of forces out more air than normal and you're kind of like <clears throat> trying to get it all back in and it kind of hurts and it kind of feels a little bit strange. You still actually have quite a bit of air inside of your lungs. Um, once you're born and you go through that process of crying and getting your first breath of air in uh, at birth, after that point, your lungs should never be without air. You may get a collapsed lung, and that's pathophysiological car accident or something like that. But even then, there's still some air that's going to be present inside of the lungs. So whenever we show a spirogram, we never just start at zero because that doesn't make any sense. We'll actually start at more, that's supposed to be a six. We'll start more around two and a half liters. So the average individual will have about two and a half liters of air inside of their lungs. And as you inspire and expire, 
you're going to add air or take air away from that two and a half liter volume that's always contained within the lungs. Let me if you can see this. So um, there's a whole host of different lung volumes that you're going to look at. But basically, you sit down, you put this snorkel in your mouth, or what looks like a snorkel, and that's what's actually measuring airflow. Um, there's a couple different ways that they'll actually do it. Sometimes it's a little fan, and that fan spins at certain speeds, and it's cor correlated to the amount of air that's flowing through it in a given unit of time. Um, some of it, it's changes, and they measure changes in temperature a couple different places across that, that device. Um, they'll plug up your nose so you can only breathe through your mouth. And they'll be like, okay, just breathe normal. And when you breathe normal, you basically increase, well, you can't even come close to seeing that, can you? Might as well be black. You can't see that either, can you? We'll just do it in, in yellow. So they'll say breathe normal, and you'll take in a little bit of air, and then you'll release a little bit of air. Take a little bit of air in, and the trace looks something like that. And they can go through, and they can quantify how tall those peaks are, and then we know that based off of that portion of the curve that you might have taken in 500 milliliters of air. And then based off of this portion of the curve, you might have released about 5 millimeters of air. They can also say, okay, from uh, the point of deflection to the point of return, how long is this time? And it can tell you a little bit about the rate that it took to get that 500 milliliters of air in. So um, can be a very important kind of clinical indicator of normal breathing. If you have asthma, maybe you're currently under an asthma attack, it takes longer time for air to get in, so the curve's going to change just a little bit. You still might be able to get your full 500 milliliters in there and release the full 500 milliliters, but that curve will expand out, indicating that there's a longer amount of time for air to be moved in and out of the lungs. Okay? This would just simply be referred to, and you'll notice this, in your reading as you go through some of these lung volumes uh, in lab and in, in the textbook that it's just simply called a tidal volume. So right now, all of you, your normal breathing rate, 12 to 20 breaths in a minute for each of you, about 500 milliliters there in and out of the lungs through those 12 to 20 breaths, you're just participating in normal tidal volume. There's also going to be a maximal amount of air that you can put in and a maximal amount of air that you can release from your lungs. Um, and we can measure that. We can measure both how much air is taken in and how long it takes to get that air out. Look at the curve as it changes with uh, aspect to both amplitude or height of the, of the wave and then width of the wave, indicating um, Again, how much air can be moved in and out of the lungs and how much air can be uh, moved in and out of the lungs at a given unit of time. And all of these have different names and you need to begin to kind of get some exposure to that. So that's as far as I'm going to go with this just because, you know, for sake of time, um, you're going to get more exposure to this during lab. There's plenty of information in your book as well. And it's not really that hard of a concept to figure out once you kind of get an idea and you can go through and say, okay, I know tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, expiratory reserve, residual volumes, total lung volumes, and you know all of those different volumes, you can look at one of these and you can begin to dissect it and really have a good idea of what's going on with, uh, with individuals, whether the breathing is normal or it deviates from normal. Okay, what I really want to finish up with is how gas is actually exchanged. We know how to move air into the lungs. We basically are going to use changes in thoracic volume to change pressure, to create pressure gradients that allow air to move into or out of the lungs. But once air loads up in the alveoli, we have to get it into the bloodstream, circulate it to the working tissue, get it into the interstitial fluid, get it into the cell, and then utilize it in the cell through a metabolic pathway. The whole process begins with gas exchange because basically this is the idea of taking gas that exists in air 
and dissolving it into the blood. So once we have air in the lungs, we have to transfer, transfer it into the blood. And now again, you're going to remember that we do this through two layers of cells. So we have to diffuse the gases across two cell layers. Anyone remember what those two cell layers were? We have to move it across the cells of the alveoli, and we have to move it across the cell of the blood capillary. And the way that this is done, at the onset, most of you probably be like, oh, okay, so you get really high pressure in the lungs, and it's just going to move into the blood. It's just going to move in through that really high pressure. And that's sort of right, but it's also really wrong. Because we have oxygen that has to go in one direction and carbon dioxide that has to go in the other direction. Oxygen appears to go in direction of high pressure in the lungs to lower pressure in the blood. But carbon dioxide actually goes against that. And there's a really good reason for that. But before we can really get there, we have to really understand what it means for the gas that is around, the, around us in this room or in our lungs or in our blood to have pressure. And I'm going to start with the air that's in this room. So what does it actually mean when we say the barometric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury? What does that actually mean? indicate or tell us. So the air that's in this room, it exerts about 760 millimeters of mercury of pressure. So if we had a column of mercury, so here's my column of mercury. So we fill it up a little bit off. So we fill this up with, with mercury. And now the downward force of the air that's in this room would push on this column of mercury so that it would go up to 760 millimeters. So in this long column, the force would push down on that column of mercury and have enough force that it would go up to 760 millimeters. From zero to 760 millimeters. Okay? So why does this actually happen? Why does air and the fluid that's are the fluids that are around us, why do they actually have pressure? And the answer is because they're composed, these fluids are composed of various gases. And those various gases our matter, matter has mass, and it takes up space. So anything that takes up a little bit of space is going to exert a force in that space that it's taking up. And as you can guess, the more matter that we have, the more pressure or force that can be exerted. And on the planet, if this is Earth, and this is our atmosphere up here, we have, because of the way the Earth is formed, this great gravitational pull where all of matter is being pulled down towards the center of Earth. You stand on the ground and can't fly <laughs> because you are being pulled towards the center of Earth. You are being pulled towards the center of Earth because you are mass. You have matter, and you also matter, but that's besides the point. You have mass, you take up space, you fall into and are affected by the effects, or by the, by the gravitational coefficient and the gravitational pull. 
oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, water vapor are all pulled by gravity as well. And the closer you get to Earth, the more gravitational pull there is. So way up here where planes fly, 35,000 feet, most of this, uh, yeah, most of the gases that are up there at 35,000 feet um, have been pulled away towards the crust of the Earth, towards the center of the Earth. So there's very low amounts of air up here. And as you get closer to the surface, there's tons of gases down here because they're being pulled in towards the center of the Earth. If I take and sort of say, okay, I'm going to measure this column of gas here, all of those little tiny particles all the way down until we get down to the, to the crust of the Earth are going to have force that is pushing down towards the center of the Earth because of that gravitational pull. And we can measure it with a ver the, the device here, the millimeters of a column of mercury is just simply a way we can quantify it. We could do it with a column of water. We could do it with a barometer. I don't know, you could even do it with a peanut butter jar and a balloon and a straw. And you can take that peanut butter jar and you can put the balloon over the surface of the peanut butter jar and put a little straw in there that, in, that basically runs against a, uh, a ruler. Put the ruler there peanut butter jar, and as pressure changes, the balloon gets pulled in towards the, because you're, you're basically creating a container where pressure doesn't change, and then the environment where the pressure is changing just a little bit, and as pressure changes, if there's higher pressure outside, it pushes that balloon into, into the mouth of the peanut butter jar. If there is uh, lower pressure outside, the peanut butter jar, the air that got trapped inside of there pushes back out, and so it causes the balloon to blow up a little bit. I don't know, it's a great little science experiment and for it at home. Just get a peanut butter jar and a balloon, put the balloon over the mouth of the peanut butter jar, and you'll see that peanut, the balloon change as you look, as you watch, it'll change. Sometimes it'll kind of bow into the jar, some other times it'll kind of dome up on the jar, and that's because of the changes of pressure. And you put a straw in there and put it next to a ruler, and that's a way you can quantify how the pressure is changing. I don't know what they would call that, PB, PB and J. My pressure is three peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So that's just simply a way to quantify the fact that we have all of these things happening with the distribution of gases really in the environment that we're living in. So. The air around us is composed of a variety of different gases. Uh, it's exerting, on average, 760 millimeters of mercury. But if we take it a step further, we can begin to look at each individual molecule, each individual piece of matter that's in there. And we're going to find that there's nitrogen that's present. And if we were able to go through and just you know, pull 100 molecules at random and we're able to count them, we find that 78% of the total is nitrogen. There's also oxygen present, and that's about 21%. Carbon dioxide is actually extremely low. If we measure carbon dioxide, it's basically 0.04% of that total. Now if you go through and do the math, we're basically at about 99%, just over 99%. And so there's just the last little kind of trace of what I'm just going to uh, qualify as other gases. Water vapor, some helium, argon, and those other gases, that actually should be the other way. Those other gases are less than 1%. So the two big ones are going to be nitrogen and oxygen. But we got to take it even a step further. So you could go through and you could say, okay, so 78% of the total here is nitrogen. 78% of the air that's around you right now is nitrogen. And 
you can say that it exerts its own pressure that makes up or adds up with the other gases to 760 millimeters of mercury. So each gas exerts their own pressure. So to kind of explain what's going on here, I got a little model to draw out. So this is a container, and I'm just simply going to put on this container I'm going to put a stem with a valve. So this is a little tiny valve, and I can turn that valve open and close, and it opens up that entrance into the container. Inside of the container, I have quite a bit of nitrogen, a lower amount of oxygen, and let's say total pressure here is 100 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so it's a pretty low system. Uh, a little, pretty low pressure in the system, large amounts of uh, nitrogen, the remainder is oxygen. Now out here is the environment, so you can imagine this is a box sitting right here. Out here in the environment, 760 millimeters of mercury. Let's say that it's a really low amount of nitrogen and a really large amount of oxygen, which is a little bit untrue for the real environment. So what would happen if I opened up that valve? How is the oxygen and nitrogen and how is the gas going to flow? Okay, very good. So most people would say, oh, well, I mean, you're going to have gas that flows in. All the gas is going to flow in because it's from a high pressure to a low pressure. But these gases actually act on their own gradients, and they're called partial pressure gradients. So when I open this valve up, nitrogen actually is going to seemingly go against the gradient because it's going from the area of low pressure in the container to high pressure outside of the container. But in all reality, it's actually acting just like we should expect because it's going from a high nitrogen pressure to a lower nitrogen pressure. So I have this partial pot concentration, this partial pressure gradient, rather, that favors the movement of nitrogen from its high pressure source to its lower pressure source, whereas oxygen would go in the direction that we would expect from outside to inside the container. And so it really has very little to do with these total pressures, but everything to do with the partial pressures when it comes down to moving gases from one container to another container. Now take this and turn this into your lungs and leave this as your environment. And we now have a really good understanding just by remembering how much gas or how large the gas concentrations are inside and outside, how gases are going to actually move across those two cell layers. What I said is <laughs> oh, Siri, you're so dumb. <laughs> yeah, is everybody everybody got all that? So each gas exerts its own pressure and they add up to the total. And it's based on the percentage of gas. the percentage of gas that's present. So let me sort of break this down. Break it down with an example. And we're going to use the air that's out here in the environment, 760 millimeters of mercury. That's my total. Now that total, if it is a mixture of gases, it's not really that relevant. But we can go through, and based off of that total, we can now calculate 
the pressure that's exerted by a specific gas, let's say oxygen. Okay, so oxygen, anyone remember what the percentage of the gas was in the environment? 21%. I'm going to convert that into a decimal because I never work with percentages. So decimal form of 21% is 0 0.21. And if I just simply multiply that 0 0.21 times my total gas of 760 millimeters of mercury, when I calculate that out, it's 176 millimeters of mercury. Okay? That means that out here in the environment, For oxygen, it's always right around 176 millimeters of mercury. Now, for me to move, <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> I okay. I'm so well. So let me start over. <laughs> Air out here, 760. 21% of that is 160 millimeters. So out here in the environment, oxygen is at 160 millimeters of mercury. So if I want to move oxygen into my lungs, I have to make it lower than that. I have to make the oxygen component lower than the 160 millimeters of mercury. So let's say just for some really weird reason, I have 200 millimeters of mercury of oxygen in my lungs. When I breathe in, I may have airflow, but it's not going to be oxygen that's moving in. It's going to be other gases that are at lower, uh, lower pressures inside of the lungs. So hopefully you kind of see where this is going. So the oxygen component of any environmental air that's around you accounts for 160 millimeters of mercury of that total, 760 millimeters of mercury. So the, uh, the oxygen provides 160 millimeters of mercury of the exerted pressure in that total. And what that ends up as is what we call a partial pressure. And the partial pressure is very important. It is denoted as just simply P. And so if I wanted to say partial pressure of oxygen, P is the partial pressure, and then I just subscript the O2 or the gas. And so this would be read as the partial pressure of oxygen. And I'm going to show you a figure here in just a second to illustrate all of the partial pressures that we see from the lungs to the cell and from the cell back up to the lungs. Because all of our gases are going to diffuse down their partial pressure gradients. So before I show you this figure, where do I want to have my lowest oxygen pressure? Not in my lungs. Not in the environment. Not in the blood. We're getting closer. We're very close to the tissue inside of the cell. 
in the world, <laughs> in the United States. <laughs> We want to have it inside of the cell because the cell is going to utilize oxygen at the end of the electron transport chain to facilitate the production of ATP. As the oxygen is utilized at the end of the electron transport chain, it's accepting electrons from the electron transport chain, which creates that proton motive force, the hydrogen concentration gradient between the inner mitochondrial membrane space and then the, uh, the inner portion of the mitochondria and it goes through ATP synthase. You guys, sh I'm, I know you're working through this in microbiology right now, or, or most of you are. So inside of the mitochondria, remember that's a double membrane, and we have all of those proteins in there, and then the last one is this really specialized one, ATP synthase, and Electrons are created and those electrons begin to move through the electron transport chain, but electrons only are pulled if they are pulled by electronegative force. Oxygen is basically the highest electronegative force that we have. So those electrons move through and at the end of the electron transport chain as hydrogen is moved across into the space, we want hydrogen to continually be moved through there. We move hydrogen back through here to generate our ATP. Is this sort of ringing a bell? So oxygen is going to be used right there. If I keep on building up more and more oxygen, eventually I'm going to create a high enough pressure gradient that no more oxygen would come in, and that would be not very advantageous for the production of ATP. So as that electron comes through, it combines with one of these oxygens. So the electron plus the oxygen and it generates water. And now it's no more oxygen, and since it's no more, it's no longer oxygen, it's water, it no longer affects that partial pressure gradient. Because partial pressure gradients are only for that particular gas. And once it's water, it's no longer that gas. Okay? So oxygen's going to be lowest inside of the cell. And it just basically always is pulling on oxygen. Oxygen levels are always dropping inside of the cell. They're stable out here at 160 millimeters of mercury, always dropping in the cell. We'll just, for all intents and purposes, call it zero in the cell, 160 outside of the cell, and that favors this big, long pre partial pressure gradient favoring oxygen movement into the cell. Now, carbon dioxide, really low out here, right? Figure that out. It would be 760 times. Anyone? That would give me my percentage. Decimal would be 0 0.0004. And so it's really, really low out here. We'll just call it basically zero out in the environment for all practical purposes. But inside of the cell, it's constantly being produced. And as we transport pyruvic acid, which is the end of glycolysis, into the mitochondria for Krebs cycle, we produce a molecule of CO2 every time. So it's always increasing. So we have our high pressure, partial pressure of CO2 in the cell always increasing. Very low out here, basically tending to zero, creating a big long chain that favors the movement of CO2 back out of, uh, out of the orbit. Okay? So this next figure illustrates those partial pressure gradients in the context of the anatomy of both the respiratory system, the circulatory system, and then the work of tissues. So you can go through, and this figure is in your book, it's right out of your book in fact, and what you're going to see is the air that we move in, okay, they're saying the expired air is going to have a partial pressure of oxygen of 116. And as it moves into the lungs, by the time it gets into the alveoli, the alveolar air is 104. So it's 116 out here in the environment, 104 inside. That means oxygen is favored to move in that small little segment. Once it gets into the lungs, into the alveoli, it's got to interact with the bloodstream. So what should we expect for partial pressure of oxygen in the bloodstream? It's 104 millimeters of mercury in the alveolar air, we're going to expect it to be even lower 
So the oxygenated blood, 85. And then we come through the heart and we distribute out into the tissue. And in the tissue, PC, the PO2 is 40 millimeters of mercury. Once you get into the cell, it's continually tending to zero because we're consuming it and converting it into water. So we go from 116, 160 would work as well out here in the expired air down to nearly zero once you get into the cell. Cells generating CO2, that means CO2 is constantly being increased inside of the cell. The CO2 inside of the deoxygenated blood, which is what's coming out of the tissue, so tending to infinity in the tissue, in the cells, gets into the bloodstream, it's 46. So from continually increasing above 46 to 46 to get it into the blood, pump it through the heart, pump it into the lungs. Once it's in the lungs, alveolar air, the alveolar air in the lungs is 40. So we go from 46 to 40. And then now out in the environment, the air that is being Oh, I'm sorry, I switched these two up here. 116 is what's coming back out. Um, so inspired air, the air that you're bringing in, 0.3 millimeters of mercury, 40 inside of the air. So we favor from 40 out to the 0.3. It's 159 that we breathe in. So I'm sorry about that. Expired air, you start out inspiring 159 when it comes back out it's 116 indicating that it was consumed went through that circuit was utilized by the tissue and then the amount of air that you pump back out or breathe back out is 32 32 millimeters of mercury pco2 in the environment about 0.3 millimeters of mercury but it's not ever really oxygenated or oxygen they've always yeah, but deoxygenated means doesn't mean that it's lacking oxygen. It means it's having oxygen that's removed from it or put into it. So it's about 95 here once it comes out of out of the lungs, down from 159. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going to be really comfortable if you can sort of pick up each point along the way and in relative terms what it's going to be looking like. I mean, if I were to draw this figure out on my own, you know, I would draw. Okay, so here's the environmental air. Here are my lungs. Here's my heart. Here's my <laughs> tissue. What? O2 is extremely high here, or maybe I would even do it like this, something more along these lines. Oxygen is pretty high there, a little less high there. So it favors that movement there. And then CO2 is just simply the opposite. So favors movement in that direction. So that would be the start, but I would ask questions. Um, you know, what would happen if we I don't know reduced compliance CO2 uh, or um, um, bronchial compliance in the trachea and this reduce the amount of time, it, uh, it increased the amount of time for oxygen to enter the lungs. What would happen? So this becomes even just a little bit smaller because it's taking more time to get it in. And this gets just a little bit more, a uh, little bit smaller. And then pretty soon this maybe becomes non-existent. And what if that working tissue is um, the brain? Yeah, so you're going to definitely have some issues, <laughs> might, might have some damage or something like that. Or what if it's a vessel here and we obstruct that vessel there leading into the heart or in the coronary circulation? Yeah, so cyanosis. 
Um, that's typically a vascular issue, and we're not perfusing the tissue as well with blood as, as we should, and so you lack a little bit of oxygen. Um, so yeah, really what you with cyanosis, if it was on this figure here, moving into the tissue, you're basically preventing oxygen from entering because you're not circulating blood and oxygen is used up. The hemoglobin, which are really red and become really, really red when they're bound up by oxygen, aren't really carrying oxygen all that well. They're stripping oxygen off, and so now it has more of a blue appearance because of the reduction in the iron that normally would show up. So if you got the basic concept here, that's I'm going to be real happy with that. What's that? I took a breath in my back pocket. She's like, oh, I'm so worried about things. So it's me. All right. Um, we got just a little bit of time. We'll go ahead and just at least introduce the urinary system. So the urinary system is going to be comprised of four main organs. And those organs are going to be the kidneys, which normally is going to be two. And then leading from those kidneys, we'll have your readers or ureters. And there will be two of them, one for each kidney. The ureters lead to the urinary bladder. And we should only have one of those. <laughs> And then leading away from the urinary bladder to the external environment will be the urethra. And we should only have one of those. So from an organ perspective, it's a really, really simple physiological system. But from an anatomical perspective, especially at the microscopic level, it's extremely complex. And we'll spend a good, good, good deal of time dealing with the, the microanatomy of the urinary system. The urinary system is the homeostatic regulator of the blood. And we'll pick up with that on Wednesday. We'll pick up with talking about the homeostatic regulation of the blood and what do we actually have to regulate.